mesmo. What's an internet application? Or a networked application? Some application that works by having two or more uh, two more instances of that application communicating with each other to provide the, the intended purpose. That is, it's not an application that's standalone that runs on your computer. It only works if there is one application on your computer, one on another computer in the internet, and they communicate with each other. And the example we know is a web server and a web browser only useful when you have both of them and they work by communicating with each other via some communications protocol. And an in internet application, they communicate across the internet. Inside an internet application, we could separate into, there's usually some user interface. Think of your web browser where you click on the buttons, type in the address uh, and see the web page is the user interface. So there's some code that implements that. There's the application logic, that is the code that implements what your web browser should do, how to parse the HTML and, and interpret the HTML. And there's some code in your web browser for the communications part. How do you send a request to the web server? How do you receive a or interpret the response that you receive in the web server? And similar, in most internet applications, we can separate into the user interface, the, the, the logic for performing what the application needs to do, and the communications part. We're going to focus on the communications part. The communications part implements an application layer protocol, like HTTP for web browsing. That would be an application protocol to communicate between the instances of the application, from a web browser to a web server. Or SMTP is used to communicate between email clients and servers. So different protocols here. This is the application layer. We're not going to go through all the internet applications. We're going to go through just one example, one simple example. Here are some different applications that you know of email, instant messaging, audio and video streaming and under them some example protocols that are used. So for web browsing, for web browsing we use HTTP but there's some other protocols and standards that are also relevant for web browsing like what's a URL, we'll say that today. For email SMTP is one protocol used. There are others, POP and IMAP are used. And there are formats of emails. MIME is a format of an email. For video and voice calls, talking to someone over the internet, some protocols used a SIP and RTP. So, and there are many other types of applications, including custom applications, cu applications that you develop for a specific purpose, for a bank or for uh, an internet service provider or you develop for your own game, for example. And they usually have some application layer communication protocol. We're going to look at HTTP just as an example of an application protocol. It's the one we use every day, so it's quite common. And we'll look at, before we look at it, we'll see some other aspects of how do we identify uh, computers and, and resources. So HTTP, we know already, you've seen it in the assignment. And we've seen it in some examples through this course. Web browser sends a GET request to a server. The server sends back a response, usually including the web page you requested, back to the client, the web browser. That's HTTP. We'll see a little bit more detail, but not much. When you when I when you use your web browser, you have an address bar, and to get started, you normally type in some address into that address bar. What does the address consist of? 
protocol. Normally, when we're using web browsing, we use the protocol HTTP. What else does the address consist of? When you type into some address in the address bar, what does it, what does it consist of? What is it made up of? Do you type in the IP address? Not very often. What do you type in? General, the whole thing is referred to as a URL. Sometimes you'll type in HTTP colon slash slash and some address. And maybe a slash and then some path. Now you may type it in or you may click on a link to that address. Okay? So if you hover over one of these links here, you'll see they, they are of this structure. This is a URL. It's used to identify a resource in the internet an uniform resource locator. When your computer sends an IP datagram, what is included in the header in terms of addresses? There are two addresses included in an IP datagram. What are they? Uh, not network address. Not UDP. In an IP datagram, what are the addresses included? The, the destination and source what address? Source and destination, more specific, what type of address? IP address. So in an IP datagram, whenever we send one, we set the source IP address and the destination IP address. But, so to send anything across the internet, we need to know the destination IP address. But when I, as the user, type in an address in my web browser, my internet application, I type this in. So where is the IP address? Well, no. Here. This is a domain name. Domain. A, the domain name is just a user-friendly way to represent an IP address. Our computers use IP addresses. Whenever we send an IP datagram, we must send with an IP address. But us humans are not so smart to remember IP addresses. We'd prefer some letters. So what's being created is what's called a domain name system where we have domain names, user-friendly addresses, which map to IP addresses. So let's explain how that works. The domain name system, domain names, and URLs. Then we'll, work, then we'll look at how HTTP works. How do we name things in the internet and how DNS works? The very basics. So. IP addresses are used to identify computers. In fact, more precisely, to identify interfaces on, my, on computers. My laptop has a wireless LAN interface. That wireless LAN interface has an IP address. If someone on the internet wants to send my laptop some information, it must know the IP address of that interface. Okay, so we use IP addresses to identify computers. We use domain names as a user-friendly way to identify computers. And then what we do is, given a domain name, we map them to IP addresses. So there's a mapping from a domain name. This corresponds to some IP address. I, as the user, enter in a domain name. There's some protocol that will go and find the corresponding IP address. And that's part of DNS. What's a domain name? Can someone give me an example domain name? Mm -hmm. 
you use them every day. Is that a W? An example domain name. It identifies a computer generally in the internet. Domain names have some structure. That is, they're not random sets of characters. They have some structure and they're maintained. That structure is maintained by different organizations. There's a hierarchical structure. We can read it on the domain name from right to left. That is, in this domain, domain name, there's a top level domain com and under the dot com there may be other domains Facebook Google whatever so under dot com they don't have to be companies they can be in generally anything uh, Normally they are companies because .com means company or commercial, but nowadays it's been expanded a bit. So there's some hierarchy. And in a, under Facebook, we see www. But there may be other subdomains. Images. .facebook.com Mail. .facebook.com And... Maybe here under IBM, there's www, and then there's dot .test. And under that, there's A, B, C. So there may be a domain name a.test.ibm.com. See the hierarchical structure? We have a top-level domain, then under that, subdomains, and then we can have an arbitrary number of subdomains. There are different top-level domains. .com is one of them. There are others. And you've seen a lot of them. .net, .org, .name, .info. And in the recent years, they've been expanded. So there are more. And they're, they're more are coming available. Uh, in, the, in the past, it was mainly .com, .org, .net. But some new ones are being added. These are called top-level domains. All three. All set it up. Who creates them? There's an organization called ICANN. I C A N N. ICANN. They have the, the responsibility for creating new top level domains. And in fact, they're doing some recently, and it's quite uh, uh, important uh, and, and controversial approach because it has an impact on companies. That is, the companies would like to have well-known domain names so that people can remember and visit their site and they can make money. So uh, there's a lot of interest in what the top-level domain should be and also who gets one of the top-level or one of the names in the top-level domains. If you had apple.com and the company Apple wanted it, then of course they may have to pay you money to get it. So there's a lot of political and, and business issues with how to manage this. But there are organizations that manage the top level domains. And they usually, I can, offloads the process to other companies. So there's a company that manages the .com. If you want a .com domain, you need to go to that company and register, pay some money and you get access. And there are some different rules for the different top level domains. Then there are country code top-level domains. These are generic. Mainly they've come from the US, but they don't have to be US oriented. So these are generic. Then the country codes are managed inside each country. So in Thailand we have, what, .th, under that, .co, companies, academic, IN is one, internet, which one? No, AC. In Thailand, it's tu.ac.th. Okay? Different, different countries 
select their own subdomains and manage them separately. So there's, um, there's an organization in Thailand that allocates domain names. You need to go to them and register domain names. And there are others. And there are different rules depending upon whether it's an academic institution or it's a company and so on. And again, there are organizations and they may distribute that to different organizations to, to main, maintain some register of who owns which domain name. So that's the basics of domain names. They are used to identify computers in the internet, user-friendly ways to identify computers. Another identifier or a type of address we see and what we've got on the board here is a URL, a uniform resource locator. Domain names identify computers, URLs identify resources, e.g. files on a computer. In fact, a URL is a, a specific type of a URI, uniform resource identifier. There's a URI and under that there's URLs, URNs, uniform resource names, and I think there's another one, but I cannot remember. But the main one we see is a URL, a uniform resource locator. And it has some structure. We'll just see the example structure. I make the note, there are many options in here, and there's also some exceptions. So it's not exactly how we present here, but this is the most common that we'll see of a structure of a URL. We have a scheme. The scheme indicates the application protocol used to access the resource. In our example on the board, HTTP is the scheme. It's the protocol we're going to use to access the resource specified by the rest. A colon and then with most cases we follow that with a two slashes, slash slash. Of course, it doesn't have to be HTTP. We may see HTTPS sometimes if you want to use secure web access. You can see others, FTP, IP for printing, SIP. So depending on what the protocol you're using, you, the scheme will differ. The most common one we see with web browsers is HTTP. Then we can optionally have a user if you need to specify the username who's supposed to access that resource, we can specify it here. Followed by an at symbol. And then the host, the computer that has the resource, which is either a domain name or an IP address. Either can be used. So the host part is the, the host or the computer that stores the resource, typically a domain name, sometimes an IP address. If you know the IP address, use the IP address. Then, optionally, follow a colon, we have port, a port number. The port number identifies the application on that host. When you, in our example, we do not have a port number. So it would be here. If we don't specify a port number, our client application will choose a default port number. If we're using HTTP, my client will choose port 80 because the default port used by web servers is 80. But optionally, I could put in some value. I could put in 80 or whatever I choose. If I put in 1234, it means my client would send a request to the computer identified by www.example.com and to the destination port 1234. So we can specify the port. <coughs> Following the port is a path, which is, refers to a file in some directory. So in our case, the path is test or slash test slash index.html. Index.html is the file, test is a, a directory. So that's the path. We may have following, not in this case, we may have a question mark and some query at the end. 
where we see some attribute value pairs, some key equals value. And if we want to have multiple keys, key equal value, ampersand or and key equals value and so on. Not all parts are required, but we'll see. You've probably seen some of these or most of these in practice. Some examples show them. The first one, like it's on the board, HTTP, domain name, path. The second one, instead of using a domain name, we can enter in the IP address. And we can specify the port number. If we knew the web server was using port number 40240, in my web browser, I could type in the second URL. Specify the IP address of the web server and the port number used by that web server. And then the destination IP address would be 73.16.0.4 and the destination port would be 40240. If I don't specify the port, my web browser will use by default 80 in that case. We can use HTTPS. We can have queries at the end. You see that if you're developing some dynamic website sometimes. Say your, your database back end for your website for your project and you have a web page that allows you to select information from that database. You can include some keys and values in the URL. Not just used for web browsing, used for other applications. You would have seen them used for email sometimes. So you can write a URL like this, mail to some username at some host and a query, subject equals test. If you clicked on a link, most likely your web browser today would open your mail client and create a, an email with the destination being steve at example.com and set the subject in that email to be test and then let you type in the rest of the email and press send. So that's how such a URL could be used. When you connect remotely to other computers using, for example, Secure Shell, like you did in creating your password at the start of the semester, you can use a URL to, to specify connect using ssh to example.com using username Steve. You can also specify a password using username Steve and this password. Okay, so you can combine them and they're used in different applications. That's a URL. So we have IP addresses, which computers use to identify other computers. Domain names, which us humans use to identify other computers. And URLs to identify resources on those computers, specifically files and the, the means for accessing those resources. So the question arises now, if our computer uses an IP address and we use a domain name, how are they related? And that's what the domain name system... Uh, ...defines. I'll use an example on the board to illustrate DNS. There's a slightly more technical example here, but we'll go through a simpler one. And with a simple example, we'll try and explain the concepts that are listed here. Let's say our internet, here's my computer, has an IP address, 1234, and there are some other computers on the internet, 5.6.7.8, and another computer here, 11.1.1. .1 .1. And there are other computers on the internet. Let's assume they all have their IP address, their unique IP addresses. If I, my computer wants to communicate with one of these other computers, I need to know its IP address. But we know, in most cases, when we use our internet applications, we do not type in an IP address, we type in a domain name. I, as the user, type in a domain name, but my computer needs to know the IP address. 
Some computers on the internet have both an IP address and a domain name. Let's give these domain names. Example.com and www.test.org. So these two computers also have domain names. How did they get them? They went to some organization, ICANN or whoever they've uh, uh, allocated to manage the .com and the .org domains. They've gone to that organization and registered, paid their money for the yearly access and this, the company that owns this computer registered example.com and the company owning this one registered test.org. The company themselves can normally allocate whatever they like here. They can allocate www, web, mail, whatever they like. They can have multiple subdomains. So they are registered by the companies owning these computers. I want to access using my URL www.example.com from my client, my web browser here. I want to access some resource on this computer. I know its domain name. I don't know its IP address. To send a packet or a datagram to it, I need to know its IP address. How does that work? When these companies obtain their domain names, they also register them on some special server in the internet, a DNS server. In fact, yeah. That's an IP address. Whatever you want it to be. 11. Dot. The IP address of this computer. Doesn't matter what the value is, just for an example. There's another computer in the internet, a DNS server. It has an IP address 8.8.8.8, just another computer. But it has a special purpose. And its purpose is to keep a database that maps domain names to IP addresses. So the company running this computer, 11.1.1.1, has gone to the company owning the DNS server and registered in their database that the domain name www.test.org corresponds to the IP address 11.1.1.1. So this DNS server stores some database. Uh, let's make some space. Uh, domain, it has some simple database. Domain and IP address. One of them is test.org and stores the corresponding IP address. And similar, the company owning this computer does the same. Goes to the DNS server and says, I've got example.com and my IP is 5678. We're going to go through a very simple ver simpli simplified version of DNS. In, in real life it's much more complex than what we'll show, but we'll, we'll at least learn the, the concepts. So a DNS server keeps some database or table mapping domain names to IP addresses. Everyone who has a domain name needs to register their mapping of domain name to IP address in some DNS server. In real life there are more than one DNS server in the internet. There are many. Okay. Not every computer needs a domain name. Normally just servers have domain names. The computers that need domain names are those that uh, they want other people to be able to access their computer. My laptop doesn't need a domain name because I don't need or in fact I don't need someone else to initiate communications with my laptop. I would like to initiate communications with other computers, so they those other computers need domain names, but there's no case where someone wants to initiate communications with my computer. So it doesn't need a, a domain name. It may have one, but it may not. Generally, normally you think clients don't have a domain name, servers do have domain names. 
those that offer some service in terms of the application, a web server, for example. Now, in my browser, the user typed in the URL on the other side. We need to know the IP address. Inside my computer, there's some DNS software. What that does is when the user types in a domain name, this automatically <coughs> sends a query saying, what is the IP address for this domain name? And in this case, we send the query to the DNS server. And there's a protocol for doing this. It's called the DNS protocol. So the, there's a query message saying, in, if we use the example over there, www.example.com. So the meaning of this message is, I want to know the IP address that corresponds to example.com. The DNS software inside my computer sends it to a DNS server. The server looks up its database. It matches this one and therefore sends back a response. with the value of the IP address, 5.6.7.8. That's the DNS protocol going to work. It involves some DNS software on your computer, a resolver, and some DNS server. And it assumes that the DNS server already has some values mapping domain to IP. They were created because the people owning those servers told the DNS server. And after that happens, my computer now knows the IP address of the computer I need to send an IP datagram to. Now I can send data, an IP datagram, to the destination. Because I know its IP address. And I need its IP address to send some, some IP packet. Because in the IP packet, remember the destination address in this case, must be five, six, seven, eight. So DNS happens before we send our data. It maps a domain name to IP address. And that's the basics of what we need to know, or what you need to know for DNS. There's one or two more things, but that's the basics. Any questions on that? Yeah? So, the client doesn't have the IP address on it, right? The client does have an IP address. It's 1.2.3.4. We assume all of our computers that want to communicate in the internet have an IP address. But when I open my browser as the client, the client initiates communications. So the client specifies who it wants to communicate with. But the user only specifies, specifies a domain name. My computer at the client needs to know an IP address. And so DNS maps a domain name to an IP address. Once my computer knows the destination IP address, then I can send IP datagrams across the internet. And they should reach the destination the server doesn't need, know, need to know the client's domain name because when the server receives the IP datagram, inside the header is the source address. So inside this IP datagram, there's both the destination address and the source address. When the server receives that, it knows who the client is. That's why our clients generally don't need domain names, only servers. Any other problems? This describes some of it, but I think if you can understand what we've gone through on the board, you're OK. IP datagram is, if we think of the internet protocol, it's the, the, the name of the message we send. We call it a datagram. Sometimes we call it an IP packet, but uh, we, 
maybe the better name is an IP datagram. Same as we, in TCP we say we send TCP segments. We, in wireless LAN, we send wireless LAN frames. In IP, we send IP datagrams. It's just the name of the message that we send. It's not commonly referred to. Uh, no, don't do not connect it. Although there is some connection, but name of the the name of the box. Yeah. Okay. Well, not the box, but the name of the of this. This is an IP datagram. Sometimes we refer more generally as a packet. It's an IP packet. It's a TCP packet. It's a wireless LAN packet. The more common specific names are datagrams, segments, frames, messages, maybe. Yep. Uh, what's the difference between a datagram and a, pa and a packet? Uh, there's no one, one common, one defined use of the terminology. It's just different terminology we use to identify the, what we send. So a good way to think of it is a packet is a, no, a general name. It can be used across multiple layers. I have a HTTP packet. I have a TCP packet, an IP packet. A more specific name may be a HTTP message, a TCP segment, an IP datagram. So just the terminology used. There's no difference in terms of the structure. Or anything. segment for TCP normally. What's missing from here? For this to work, my computer needed to know where to send the query to. My computer needed to have some values in its configuration saying the DNS server was 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. And you've seen this. When you set up your network connection, you may see there's a, a field or parameter DNS server. Let's look. And my computer, uh, when I look at my network configuration, I can look at the connection information. Same in Windows, you look at the network properties. Shows my IP address. 10.10.99.251, some other information about my address, and importantly shows a primary DNS server, 10.10.10.9, and also a backup or secondary DNS server, 192.168.20.103. You can have multiple DNS servers, which means the idea, if I send a query to the first one, maybe I don't get a response, or it takes a long time to get a response, then send a query to the backup, the secondary DNS server. So you normally have at least two DNS servers in case one doesn't respond or, or is uh, overloaded. That needs to be configured so that my computer knows the IP address of who to send the query to. You can change that. In Linux and Unix operating systems, there's a program called NSLOOKUP. Actually, also the same on Windows, NSLOOKUP. And it's a, normally, as users, we don't care about the mapping from domain name to IP address. It's done automatically by the, com the software on your computer. But we can use this NSLOOKUP to look up an IP address for a given domain name. For example, I want to know the IP address for ICT server and the second command I'm going to give is the name of the actually we'll try a different one first the name of the DNS server to ask so the idea is that this is going to trigger my computer to send a query querying this domain name and send the query to this DNS server 10.10.10.9 that happened then and the DNS server sent back a response. 
So the first two lines say who sent the response. The next two lines say what is the response. This domain name, ICT, corresponds to IP address 203.131.209.82. Okay. So that the answer is the last two lines. The first two is just identifying who sent the response, where we got the where we got the response from. So that was the case. I sent the query to one DNS server. In the internet, there's not just one DNS server. There are many DNS servers. The the information of mapping domain names to IP addresses is distributed across many DNS servers. I can choose a DNS server. 10.10.10.9 is an SIT DNS server. It's inside this campus. Most organizations may maintain their own DNS server. Google offers a free public DNS server. The IP address is this 8888. In that case, my computer just sent a request to the Google DNS server, got a response, and thankfully the same IP address. In the, ideally, in the different DNS servers across the world, there should be the same mappings from domain name to IP address. But sometimes a DNS server may not have that mapping. In which case, if you receive a query, you can send the query onto another DNS server. There can be some hierarchy of sending the queries. If we query some domain name that this server doesn't know about, it can send on to another DNS server. And hopefully they have the response. And again, there's some hierarchy of DNS servers. And we can look up different domain names. Query for the google.co.th domain name asking 8.8.8 and we get a response. The IP address for the Google web server is 74.125.135.94. In this case, how does the computer know the DNS server? I told it here. Usually, it's either when you configure your network interface you set your own DNS server or most likely you didn't set your network interface most likely when you connect say to SIT network you automatically get an IP address at the same using the same way that you automatically get an IP address the SIT network automatically gives you DNS servers using DHCP so there's a protocol for when you turn on your computer in SIT to automatically obtain an IP address and that also allows you to obtain a DNS server address and that's what happened that's where these values came from when I connected to the SIT wireless LAN I didn't specify the IP address there was a special protocol that gave me an IP address this one and it also gave me these values I didn't type them in okay so in practice it can be automatically distributed to computers on a network. If SIT changes this address, then next time I connect, I will get the updated version, the updated value. One last thing before we finish DNS. DNS servers use port number 53. That's what the 53 here. That's the default port number for DNS servers. Uh, same as the default port number for web servers is 80. It can be changed, but most commonly it's 53. So this DNS server actually runs an application listening on or receiving requests on this address and listening on port 53. The web server uses port 80. Web server, port 80, the transport protocol is TCP. With DNS, the transport protocol is UDP. So this query 
when we send the query, we're actually creating a query message and it's sent using UDP to the server. And the response is a UDP packet. And the server uses port 53. The client can use any or a random port number. I'll show another example after we go through HTTP. But before we do that, any questions on DNS? Can we ignore? Uh, yes, I'm not going to do it because it gives us strength. Well, let's do it. When we use NSLOOKUP, if I don't give this second parameter here, my computer will use one of it, the, the, the automatically configured DNS service. It's just my computer or the operating system does it slightly different than normally. So we get the same result. So I didn't specify the DNS server. In that case, the query was sent to where? Where did I send the query to in that case? DNS server. Where is the DNS server? The server is at 127.0.0.1. Where is it? What does that address mean? What is specifically 127.0.0.1? It's an IP address. What the, is the special case address that it is? It's a loopback address. It's sent to yourself. What ha happens actually, my operating system runs its own DNS server. So my query went to my own DNS server on the same computer. And if that, my own DNS server didn't have a response, then it would send it out. But this program doesn't show whether mine sends it out. So. For example, I have a cache of values, of previous use values, and they're stored locally on my computer. And in that way, I can get a fast response by using a cached value. That's why this one's a bit strange. It's not so common. It's just for that specific operating system. If you do it on a Mac, what happens? If you do it on a Mac, it's you get If I did it on a Mac or a different computer, this value would be 10, 10, 10, 9. 10, 10, 10, 9, hash 53. It's just on my operating system, it uses a local DNS server as well. If you do it on Windows, you can do the same thing on Windows and you'll see where your DNS server is or who it is and the IP address. That's all we want to cover with DNS. That example on the board and what we demonstrated is illustrates the main concepts of DNS. It's more complex than what we've covered because there's many DNS servers, but the concepts, the basic concepts still apply. So on my web browser, I typed in the URL, the one over here, and because it contained a domain name, before I send a HTTP request, DNS goes to work, automatically sends a query, gets a response, determines the IP address, and now HTTP goes to work to send a HTTP request to the web server, and the web server sends back some response. That's the next step. How does HTTP work? In the exam, yes. But you know it all already. You've either seen it in the assignment or we've even seen it in some of our examples in the lectures. And the basics of very simple. 
HTTP is a request response protocol. You send one request and the server sends back one response. There's a client and a server. The client is sometimes formally called a user agent. The client is your web browser. Sometimes it's called a user agent. Your client sends a request to a server. The server sends back a response. If you want to get more information, then you need to send another request. You'll get one response. The default port number for a server is 80. We've seen that many times. The request messages in HTTP and the responses have some format. We're not going to explain the details of the format and you don't have to remember the details of the format of the messages, just understand the basic concepts or the most common ones. And that's best shown through example. I open my web browser at step one. In the address bar, I type in a, some address, a URL. I press enter. Assuming DNS has gone to work and found the IP address, then HTTP sends a GET request from the browser to the server. A GET request meaning my browser wants to get some resource from that server. That resource is identified by the path here. In this example, I want to get the file index.html from the directory test that's on the web server. When the web server receives that request, it looks up, does the file exist? And it's accessible by users? If so, the server takes the contents of the file here and puts them in a response, attaches some status line in the response and sends it back. Where the status line says what protocol and the version being used and some status code, a message. The normal status code when everything's successful is 200 OK. We'll see some others shortly. So that's the very basic way that HTTP works. Send a request for a file. If it exists, send back the file in some response. If you want another file, you need to send another request and you'll get another response. And when the response is received at step three, your web browser takes the HTML and uses it to display the, the graphical uh, uh, version on your screen. Okay, so it sets the title, the headers, and so on. Any questions on HTTP? Exam is in three or four days. What if there's no page? Okay, what if there's no page? So there are different types of requests. The most common one we'll see is a GET request, but there are others. And there are different types of responses. A successful response is 200 OK, there are others. Different types of requests, they're called methods, GET, HEAD, OPTIONS, POST. Most common one we'll see is GET, but there are others, that's all. Again, you don't need to know them, uh, just giving examples. In the responses, it starts with a version of the protocol, status code, and status reason. There are different responses that can come back. 200 OK, if successful. If the file doesn't exist, you get a 404 not found response. And you've seen this when you access web pages that are not available, or do not exist. If you need to supply a Username and passwords, you may get a response 401 unauthorized. You sometimes may get 304 not modified responses. You use your browser, you access some web page. One minute later, with your browser, you access the same web page. In the first case, the server sends back 200 OK and the server includes the web page. The next time you access that same web page, the server may recognize, ah, you just accessed this web page one minute ago. It has not been modified since then. So the server sends back this 304 not modified response. 
It doesn't include the web page. It just sends back a short response, not modified. What your browser does when it sees this recognizes, okay, I've requested this web page previously. The server says it hasn't changed since the last request. Let's look in my local cache, which is stored on the hard drive, and load it from there. It's faster because you don't have to send back the entire web page. So your browser has a cache of previously accessed web pages. And this is a response from the server saying, it hasn't changed since last time. Use the, your local copy to display on the screen. And there are others. Okay. Inside both requests and responses, there are optional headers as well. And these are some examples. Let's finish with one final example. Not this one. Uh, we'll say something about this one. This is an example. We request some page, sends back 200 OK. Sometimes later, I click on a link. My browser requests another page, sends back 200 OK. You know that some HTML may refer to style sheets. It may refer to images. What happens when a response contains HTML referring to an image is your web browser automatically requests that image. That's here. Let's say this HTML contained a link to image.gif. Then my web browser recognizes that and then automatically sends a request for that image. And the server sends back the image and then it's displayed in my web browser. And if there were 10 images, there would be 10 different requests and responses. And if you send a request for a page that doesn't exist, 404 not found. Okay. And some error message shown on your browser. The example I want to show is from the assignment capture. In the assignment, I gave you a capture where I access many web pages. This is just a selection of that. What is the orange packet? DNS. Specifically? Um, DNS, but what about DNS? Who uh, sent it? It's a query. It's a query. You may not remember, but in this example, my computer was 192.168.0.104. And in this case, my computer, the first packet, the orange one, is using DNS. It's a query. It gives us a su summary information here, querying for the domain ICT.SITTUACTH. So what's happened is I accessed, in my web browser, I typed in a URL. We know the URL contained the domain name ICT. Because in the URL that I typed in, I included this domain name. As a result, DNS in my computer sent a query. Who did it send it to? One of my server. DNS servers. Server. DNS server. In this case, it in fact sent to both of my DNS servers. We see the first and the second message are the same queries, but to different DNS servers. Normally, you have two or more DNS servers configured with the idea is that you should get a response from one of them quickly. And we see, in fact, we get two responses. The response says the corresponding IP address is 203.131.209.82. The orange packet, the details are shown here. It's a DNS query. If we draw that packet, It's a DNS query. UDP is the transport layer. IP is the data uh, network layer. Running out of space. LLC and 802.11. That is these two. That's the, the layering of that packet. That's that one packet. It's a DNS request, but it's carried inside UDP as the transport protocol, which is carried inside an IP datagram which is in fact inside a wireless LAN frame. 
we use wireless LAN in this case. And the destination port of this query is port 53, which is the default port used by DNS servers. And the response, one of the responses comes back. Still similar, DNS response. And in the response, if we look, we'll see the IP address, the answer. What's this packet? What is this packet, the orange one? It's a SYN packet. What's the purpose? Or open a connection, open a TCP connection. So the first thing my computer did was to obtain the IP address of the web server. That's the DNS. Now I want to send a HTTP request to the DNS server, uh, to the web server. HTTP uses TCP. So to send TCP data to a web server, we first open a connection. The orange packet is the SYN to open a connection. Source address is my computer. Destination is the IP address that we got from the DNS response, the .82 address. So in this case, my computer is sending, wants to cr create a connection to the web server. SYN, SYN ACK, ACK. TCP connection establishment, three-way handshake, SYN, SYN ACK, ACK. That's what happened there. And now I've created a connection, I can send data to the server. The next packet is the data. What is the data in this TCP segment? The data is a HTTP request. If we draw it, we can draw it like this. The HTTP request, it's inside a TCP segment inside IP, LLC and 802.11. They normally treat them the same. That's the wireless LAN or, or related to wireless LAN. That's the highlighted orange packet. It's a HTTP request. So we knew we wanted to send data using TCP so the the preceding three packets are setting up a connection from my computer to the server. Then we send data. The data, in fact, is the HTTP GET request. Let's zoom in on the, the data in this case. What is the HTTP GET request? We see here the first line contains the word GET the path and the version of the protocol being used. Which means we know we're using HTTP. We know the domain that I accessed and we now know the path. So that's the URL I typed into my browser. This one on the board is the current highlighted packet. Yeah. It is this grey one. We see it is, it is a, a, a graphical representation of this packet. We see the layers and how Wireshark reports it. Here's the topmost layer, HTTP, transport layer, TCP, network layer, IP. All right, these almost go together as the data link layer. It's split into two parts, which is wireless LAN. And this is something to indicate that it's sent wirelessly via radio link. We don't see the physical layer, because that's done in the hardware. So I draw HTTP, TCP, inside IP, LLC, and 802.11. Total size, 425 bytes. That's from the start to the end. The request includes this first line, 
but also some optional headers. For example, it includes the, the domain name of the, the server. It includes some identifier of my web browser, the user agent, Mozilla Firefox, and the operating system it's running on, or the version. And we, you can look, there are many other options or several other optional headers included there. Just telling the server something about the web browser. What's this packet? The orange one? TCP. Specific, more specific? A TCP ACK. I send TCP data to the server containing the GET request. The server sends back a TCP ACK saying I've received that data. There's no data inside this message. This one? What is this? We're almost finished. It's the HTTP response. So we send a request in 855, 859, the hot orange one, is the response. Coming from the server to my computer, and the first line of that response says the version of the protocol and the status, 200 OK. Let's look in the details. Uh, sorry, let me just make some more space. In this response, again, there are some header fields, the date, the server, the content length. How long is this web page? And also in there, it's difficult to see. is the actual web page. I've highlighted inside this response down the bottom is the actual web page and you can see that here. You can see the start of the HTML, the tags in there. Uh, this is, you can see the title, introduction to data communications and so on. This is the HTML of the requested page. It's coming back in the response. The response was or the file at least, the web page that needs to come back is 2,856 bytes and there's also some header. So what needs to come back in the response is about 3,000, a bit more than 3,000 bytes. It's not all included in this packet. It's split across three packets. This is the start of the response. This is the next part of the response, a continuation and then the end. You can see some in here. This is still the HTML in the page. So that response is split across three TCP segments. One HTTP response, three TCP segments. scale but this is a case where the application sent data to TCP TCP decided the best way to send this is in three segments and they are the three segments captured by Wireshark one two three my computer receives those three segments and puts the data back together to get that one response so TCP broke it into smaller segments so they have appropriate size to send across the wireless LAN. Why, so why do we have the ACK sent back? 
There are, th there are three TCP data segments sent from the server to my computer. There are also some acts coming back. Thank you. Act, this is an act for the TCP data. This is an act from my computer to the server saying thank you for the data. The, the server is sending me the data. The data contains the HTTP response. And of course, I send back an act saying I've received it. And we see the orange one is an ACK, and there are some, one or two, there are two more ACKs. There's one and there's one below as well. We'll see that there's an ACK for each of these three segments. Server sent me three segments, I sent back three ACKs. And we're finished in that we've seen in this example DNS, the query and the response, where the query asks for, for a domain name, response contain an IP address. Then we saw TCP set up a connection, SYN, SYNAC, ACK. And then we saw HTTP send a request and get a response. But in fact, in this case, the response was split into three TCP segments, so they're of the right size. Any questions? And that finishes HTTP and our course. So, some questions. HTTP HTTP is the application layer. It creates this large response, delivers it to TCP. TCP decides to send that across the internet. I need to have three different segments. This is too large to send in one segment. And therefore creates three different segments, sends them to IP, who eventually sends three IP datagrams across the internet. The, the receiver receives three segments and then puts our TCP receives the three segments and puts the data back together and sends to the application. So the application, my web browser, receives all of this data. Who is the receiver? In the receiver of the response is my web browser. The so sender of the response is the server. The server sends the response to the web browser. In HTTP, the web browser sends a query to the server the server sends a response back to the web browser. Any last questions? So understand the purpose of DNS the very basics of DNS, map domain names to IP, and the basics of HTTP, request response, request response. What's next? Nothing. We're finished. We've gone from, in this course, from the lowest layer, physical layer, all the way up to the application layer, with examples of each. <laughs>